Concept 42, Ethics. Goals for this concept presentation. Define and describe the concept. Discuss ethical principles and theories. Identify ways that ethical issues impact nursing and healthcare. Definitions. Morality is a broad term without a single commonly recognized definition. Generally, the term morality is used to refer broadly to an accepted set of social standards or morals that guide behavior. Ethics and its various approaches deal more specifically with concepts of right and wrong. Although the terms ethics and morality and the descriptors ethical and moral are often used interchangeably, it is helpful to think of the various approaches to ethics as a foundation for morality and moral behavior. Thus, a simple working definition of ethics is the study or examination of morality through a variety of different approaches. To understand morality, an understanding of underlying concepts, assumptions, and methods of the various approaches to ethics is needed. Ethics is also a process involving critical thought and action. Ethical sensitivity helps us to recognize when there is an ethical problem or dilemma. Ethical reflection and analysis enable us to think critically to rank our ethical obligations and priorities, and ethical decision-making is a method for ensuring that the action we take is well-reasoned and can be justified. Finally, moral courage enables us to act on our decisions even under the most challenging circumstances. Each individual has his or her own moral comfort zone or personal mor morality within which ethical reflection and analysis occur. This comfort zone is both influenced by societal concepts of morality and unique to the individual and his or own, her own ethical foundations. Most of us do not give much thought to our ethical comfort zone. We think of ourselves as being ethical without entirely understanding how we act ethically in practice or why we so often falter ethically when confronted with difficult choices. Knowing and understanding who you are as a moral being, how you think ethically, and why you make certain decisions are critical to ethical practice as a nurse. The various approaches to ethics begin with meta-ethics, the branch of philosophy that considers fundamental questions about the nature, source, and meaning of concepts such as good and bad and right or wrong. Rather than making judgments about right and wrong, meta-ethics provides a foundation for how to think about right and wrong or good and bad, and it provides a common language to use when considering the ethical or moral dimensions of a situation. Normative ethics, on the other hand, deals with very specific judgments about right and wrong in everyday actions. Normative ethics uses the language of ethics along with factual information, prior experience, commonly held values and beliefs, and acceptable standards of behavior to make everyday judgments. When finally, when faced with a moral choice, applied ethics refers to the process of applying ethical theory and reasoning to daily life. Applied ethics is sometimes also referred to as practical ethics and it provides the justification for specific actions based on ethical reflection and reasoning. Scope and categories. The scope of ethics is broad and companies seeing many different dimensions of our lives. For example, we all live and work within larger systems, each of which has its own moral and ethical dilemmas. We are all members of a larger society, we work in organizational settings, and we function within the parameters of a particular profession. To fully understand the scope of ethics, one must consider how each of these dimensions interacts with us as individuals in shaping our ethical foundations and behavior. Societal ethics. At the top, there are societal ethics that serve the larger community. Society provides a strong normative basis for ethical behavior through the legal and regulatory systems. Law is a minimum standard of behavior to which all members of society are held and that generally serves the interest of society as a whole. Laws prohibiting fraud and abuse or unauthorized release of medical information are examples of behaviors that society has deemed immoral and unethical. Legal standards such as the clinical standard of care, liability, negligence, and malpractice are based on legal and ethical obligations owed to patients. Other areas of our professional lives are guided by regulatory parameters such as the Nurse Practice Act, 
that defines educational requirements and your scope of practice as a nurse or the accreditation standards that determine how a healthcare facility must operate. Compliance with these minimum standards for practice is expected of all healthcare professionals and the organizations within which they practice. Following the law is the most basic ethical standard required for the privilege of working as a licensed professional in healthcare. However, even as a minimum standard, law can create moral conflict for nurses, which is evident in issues such as abortion and physician-assisted suicide, on which there remains broad disagreement within society. Organizational ethics involves a set of formal and informal principles and values that guide the behavior, decisions, and actions taken by members of an organization, as well as the organizational structures, systems, practices, policies, and procedures developed to ensure ethical operation. The billions of dollars spent annually as a result of healthcare fraud and abuse is an example of ethical failures at the level of the organization. Ideally, organizational ethics directs all aspects of an organization from its mission and values to how it treats both its customers and its employees, its financial practices, and how it responds to the needs of the larger community and the environment. Professional ethics refers to the ethical standards and expectations in society of a particular profession. Because professions have a, pri a privileged ro role excuse me, in society, their members are often held to a higher standard in terms of ethics. Therefore, ethics becomes a fundamental element of one's professional identity and character as a nurse. As stated by Krieger and Godfrey, the relationship between the patient and the nurse is first and foremost an ethical one, unquote. Ethical standards and expectations of practice are often expressed in a code of ethics or a code of conduct that embodies the unique demands and philosophies of a particular profession. Unlike the minimum standard of the law, professional codes of ethics tend to offer general guidelines that are aimed at the highest ideals of practice. The Code of Ethics for Nurses of the American Nurses Association, ANA, establishes clear priorities in the ethical practice of nursing, such as compassion, respect, and primary commitment to the patient, as well as advocacy for patient rights. For example, the first principle in the ANA's Code of Ethics for Nurses states the following. The nurse in all professional relationships practices with compassion and respect for the inherent dignity, worth, and uniqueness of every individual unrestricted by considerations of social or economic status, personal attributes, or the nature of health problems. Although this is an admirable ideal, how many of us can say that we live our lives or practice our professions in ways that always treat each other with perfect compassion and respect, valuing every individual equally and without any form of bias. Instead, it is the responsibility of the individual nurse to interpret this statement in terms of what it means in each unique situation and how well or poorly it is being demonstrated in his or her professional practice. Bioethics and Clinical Ethics. Bioethics and its subcategory of clinical ethics are closely related to professional ethics. Bioethics deals broadly with ethical questions surrounding the biological sciences, emerging healthcare technologies, and health policy. Clinical ethics is involved primarily with decision making at the bedside and other patient specific issues. Research ethics is a specialized field within bioethics that examines the ethical conduct of research using human subjects and animals. Personal ethics, finally, and perhaps most important, personal ethics describes an individual's own ethical foundations and practice. Our personal ethics continuously intersect with these other categories of ethics. However, they do not perfectly overlap, so there is much potential for conflict. In addition, the sources of our ethics change over time just as we continue to change with time. Sources of ethics, the beliefs, values, and methods organizational ethics. Organizational ethics involves a set of formal and informal principles and values that guide the behavior, decisions, and actions taken by members of an organization, as well as the organizational structures, systems, practices, policies, and procedures developed to ensure ethical operation. 
the billions of dollars spent annually as a result of health care fraud and abuse is an example of ethical failures at the level of the organization. Ideally, organizational ethics directs all aspects of an organization from its mission and values to how it treats both its customers and its employees, its financial practices, and how it responds to the needs of the larger community and the environment. Professional ethics refers to the ethical standards and expectations of a particular profession. Because professions have held a privileged role in society, their members are often held to a higher standard in terms of ethics. Therefore, ethics becomes a fundamental element of one's professional identity and character as a nurse. As stated by Krieger and Godfrey, the relationship between the patient and the nurse is first and foremost an ethical one." Unquote. Ethical standards and expectations of practice are often expressed in a code of ethics or code of conduct that embodies the unique demands and philosophies of a particular profession. Unlike the minimum standard of the law, professional codes of ethics tend to offer general guidelines that are aimed at the highest ideals of practice. The Code of Ethics for Nurses and the American Nurses Association, the ANA, establishes clear priorities in the ethical practice of nursing, such as compassion, respect, and primary commitment to the patient, as well as advocacy for patients' rights. For example, the first principle in the ANA's Code of Ethics for Nurses states the following. The nurse in all professional relationships practices with compassion and respect for the inherent dignity, worth, and uniqueness of every individual unrestricted by considerations of social or economic status, personal attributes, or the nature of health problems. Although this is an admirable ideal, how many can say that we live our lives or practice our professions in ways that always treat others with perfect compassion and respect, valuing every individual equally and without any form of bias. Instead, it is the responsibility of the individual nurse to interpret this statement in terms of what it means in each unique situation and how well or poorly it is being demonstrated in his or her professional practice. Bioethics and Clinical Ethics. Bioethics and its subcategory of clinical ethics are closely related to professional ethics. Bioethics deals broadly with the ethical questions surrounding the biological sciences, emerging healthcare technologies, and health policy. Clinical ethics is involved primarily with decision-making at the bedside and other patient-specific issues. Research ethics is a specialized field within bioethics that examines the ethical conduct of research using human subjects and animals. Personal ethics, finally, and perhaps most important, personal ethics describes an individual's own ethical foundations and practice. Our personal ethics continuously intersect with other categories of ethics. However, they do not perfectly overlap so there's much potential for conflict. In addition, the sources of our ethics change over time, just as we continue to change over time as well. Attributes and criteria. The attributes of ethical nursing practice begin with the sources of ethics and involve skills and abilities needed to identify and distinguish ethical problems and dilemmas and then apply a disciplined approach to analysis and action. Sources of ethics. The beliefs, values, and methods that define ethical practice are influenced by a variety of sources. Natural intersections and places of agreement exist between the various sources. However, they can also conflict with each other, creating competing beliefs and inconsistency in the way we approach ethical issues. Family initially forms the most powerful influence on ethics, providing many of our earliest lessons about right and wrong. A similar influence is the culture in which we are raised, including cultural practices related to our ethnicity, geographic area, socioeconomic state, status, and faith tradition. Peers become a source of ethical awareness and the family for direction and are exposed to new experiences in the larger world. Education introduces new ways of thinking about difficult issues. 
professional education in particular is charged with both technical training and a person's awareness of the ethical practice of the profession. Once in the workplace, your colleagues and the organization where you work may further alter your views and your behaviors. Ethical problems and dilemmas. An ethical problem is simply a problem with an ethical dimension. Most ethical problems have a reasonably clear solution, whereas others can be quite complex or involve competing ethical priorities. An ethical dilemma involves a problem for which in order to do something right, you have to do something wrong. For example, in order to be loyal to one friend, you have to be disloyal to another. An example in patient care is determining whether aggressive treatment at the end of life will cause more harm than benefit. In other words, it is not possible to meet all the ethical requirements in the situation. Instead, you must be sensitive to the ethical dimension of, of the situation, able to use ethical concepts to analyze and reflect on the ethical conflicts within the dilemma, determine an ethically justifiable solution, and take action. Ethical analysis and decision-making. When faced with an ethical dilemma or problem, it is helpful to apply a systematic approach of ethical analysis to the process of making a decision. There are many different methods for ethical analysis. A practical approach is to use some form of decision model, and there are a number of different decision models from which you may select. One popular model for clinical decision-making in the four topics uh, method Per Johnson, a theorist, J-O-N-S-E-N, -E the four topics are medical indications, patient preferences, quality of life, and contextual features. Within each topic, questions are posed that clarify factual aspects of the case with an emphasis on common ethical principles. Answering the various questions provides a framework within which different options for action can be considered. Any approach to ethical analysis will depend heavily on one's ability to ask good questions. Asking the wrong question or failing to ask an important question will generally result in a wrong or incomplete answer. An ethical question is a question that challenges you to consider a particular ethical concept, principle, or perspective in your analysis. The following are examples of ethical questions. Do I have a duty to tell the truth? What is the greater harm? To whom is my primary loyalty? What are the best interests of my patient? Framing good ethical questions is the key to strong ethical analysis and the ability to use a variety of ethical concepts and theories naturally expands the range and quality of decisions and questions. Theoretical links. The study of ethics can be traced back to philosophers in the ancient world such as Aristotle in the West and Confucius in the East. In medicine, the Hippocratic Oath, although probably not written by Hippocrates himself, is dated to some time near the fourth century BC. The body of theory and ethics is vast, reflecting the diversity of human thought and action. Think of each theory or principle as a camera lens. Different lenses have different magnifications and filters that allow us to view exactly the same scene, but from a different angle or in a slightly different light. This body of ethical theory provides the language of ethics and allows us to explore situations from many different perspectives and points of view. The perspectives can be quite diverse. Therefore, most of us feel more strongly about some principles and are drawn toward one or two theories at most. We may have a very difficult time even trying to think in the language of other theories. Ethical conflict occurs between parties when this language fails and each party simply cannot understand the other party's reasoning or point of view. Respect for persons and ethical principles. An ethical principle is a general guide, basic truth or assumption that can be used with judgment to help determine a course of action. Principles have long been used in bioethics and clinical ethics to describe the most common ethical concerns one must consider in most cases. Although all the principles are important, they can conflict with each other in certain situations. The four principles most often cited are respect for persons, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice. Less often measured, mentioned but equally important is the principle of fidelity. 
Respect for persons simply maintains that human beings have an unconditional moral worth that requires us to treat each individual person with great value, dignity, and respect. The ethical principle of autonomy is an important extension of this principle and suggests that patients must be treated in a way that respects their self-determination by expressing their wishes and making informed choices about their treatment. Another ethical principle closely related to autonomy is veracity or the principle of telling the truth. A patient cannot make an, a decision without being informed about the treatment unless he or she has received the truth about his or her condition and the proposed treatment and in a manner that is understandable to the patient. Non-maleficence directs us to act in ways that avoid harm to others, including even the risk of harm. In healthcare, the primary focus is on harm such as pain, disability, or death. However, harm is difficult to define and both patients and providers may be concerned about a wide range of perceived harms. Another challenge in healthcare is that we are often required to inflict some harm and risk in order to benefit the patient and avoid a greater harm. However, these harms are not avoidable if we are to properly treat the patient, so we are required to carry out such treatments in ways that are unlikely to cause undue risk or needless harm. Beneficence is an obligation to do good by acting in ways that promote the welfare and best interest of others. Patients can reasonably ex expect that you as a nurse will, pr will promote their health and well-being. However, much like harm, the concept of good is difficult to define. A patient may define his or her best interests very differently than the nurse or other healthcare professional. Justice. The concept of justice is particularly complex and there are no universally accepted definitions of what constitutes justice. However, at a minimum, the principle of justice is concerned with treating people equitably, fairly, and appropriately. This means we owe our patients care and treatment that do not arbitrarily discriminate against them, and as an individual or as a member of a class of individuals. Returning to the ANA's Code of Ethics for Nurses, justice is the underlying principle that prohibits a nurse from treating patients differently based on their social or economic status, their personal attributes, or the nature of their health problems. Each patient is entitled to the same level of care and consideration. Also of concern is the concept of distributive justice and the allocation of scarce health care resources. For example, should patients receive health care resources based on an equal share, what they need, or what they deserve based on contribution or effort? Related concepts include compensatory justice, such as occurs in a malpractice settlement, and procedural justice, which requires a system of fair treatment, such as the system for allocating organs to people on a waiting list. Fidelity is the principle that requires us to act in ways that are loyal. In the role of a nurse, such, such action includes keeping your promises, doing what is expected of you, performing your duties, and being trustworthy. Fidelity sounds easy enough, but is probably the most frequent source of conflict for healthcare professionals because they owe loyalty to so many parties. In a particular situation, nurses may find themselves at odds between what they believe is right and what is in their own self-interest, what the patient or family wants, what other members of the healthcare team expect, what organizational policy dictates, or what the profession or the law requires. Ethical theories. There are many ethical theories and we can highlight a few major approaches in very simplified terms. Each theoretical approach offers a very different view of the same situation. Views that may or may not lead to similar conclusions about an ethical problem or dilemma. For example, most of us have a preference for either the consistency of rule-based approaches or the flexibility of consequence-based approaches. Likewise, some of us will be more comfortable with the highly contextual and emotionally engaged approach of relationship ethics, whereas others are more comfortable with a highly rational and detached approach to ethical analysis. Ethics of duty. An ethics of duty is based on the ethical approach of deontology in which moral duties are seen as self-evident, needing no further justification. Moral action is then based on acting according to a specific duty simply because it's the right thing to do. 
Although the consequences of our actions are important, they are a secondary consideration to duty and our intention to do the right thing. The ethical question posed is, what is my duty? For example, if a nurse becomes aware that a friend and colleague has been diverting narcotics because she has developed an addiction and the nurse reports her friend to her supervisor because that is what the organizational policy requires, she is complying with her ethical duty to report. Ethics of consequence. An ethic of consequences is based on a teleological view that moral actions are defined entirely on the basis of the outcomes or consequences of an action. Reaching a particular goal is what defines the ethical justification of an act, regardless of your sense of duty or moral intent. Consequence-based theories often weigh the advantage and disadvantages or the harms and benefit of different actions in the same situation. Utilitarianism, a common theological theory, assumes that a moral action is one that results in the greatest good for the greatest number. The basic ethical question posed is, what action will promote the greatest good with the least harm? For example, if the nurse mentioned previously reports her friend because she is concerned that some patients are being harmed when their pain medications are diverted and all patients are at risk if her friend is practicing under the influence, then her actions are primarily based on a consideration of consequences. Her goal is to protect as many patients as possible rather than following a particular rule as a matter of duty. In fact, she might act outside of the policy if she believed reporting would not result in appropriate action by her supervisor. Ethics of character. Theories that emphasize character are classified under the general category of virtue ethics. Unlike the ethics of duty or consequence, which use external principles and rules to guide actions, virtue ethics relies on the character of the individual as the primary source of moral action. Character develops over time based on life experience and our willingness to reflect on our actions and motives. Virtues are character traits that predispose a person with good intentions to act with practical wisdom. Moral virtues include respect, honesty, sympathy, charity, kindness, loyalty, and fairness, whereas practical virtues include intelligence, patience, prudence, and shrewdness. In general, a moral act must both promote good and intent intend good based on the moral predispositions of our good character. The basic ethical question might be, what is the wise action to take? Krieger and Godfrey argue strongly for virtue theory to be the core of nursing ethics, with an emphasis on the virtues of compassion, integrity, humility, and courage. In particular, the virtue of courage lies at the heart of ethical practice. It is one thing to know what one's intention should be and another to have the courage to act on that. The concept of virtue has been central to the definitions of professional, professionalism, and professional identity. Common criticisms of virtue ethics are that character varies between individuals leading to ethical inconsistency and our choices may change over time with additional experience and character development. However, a strength of a virtue based approach to nursing ethics is that it assumes character must be continually developed and refined in practice throughout a nurse's career. Ethics is a dynamic element of practice that cannot be reduced to simple habits of following rules or weighing outcomes. In the case of our nurse with the impaired colleague, a character-based approach would lead her to act based on a combination of her own good intentions to protect her friend, the patients, and the organization while also seeking the best possible outcome for all. She would be guided primarily by some combination of her own moral and practical virtues and on the basis of her, her professional sense of identity rather than by the externally dictated rules and consequences. Ethics of relationship. Ethical theories that emphasize relationship are focused on the nature and obligations inherent in human relationships and community. With some roots in feminist thought, the ethic of care approaches difficult ethical situations in a context-specific manner that searches for solutions in the particular details of the situation. Universal principles are used only to the extent they can be applied based on the unique circumstances of each situation. Primary attention is paid to preserving relationships, improving communication, enhancing cooperation, and minimizing harm to everyone involved while promoting an ideal of caring 
The basic ethical question is the ethic of care might be, what is the caring response? Such an approach is very different from the highly abstract, rational, unemotional, and rule-oriented approach of most Western ethical traditions. Although duty-based, consequence-based, and to a lesser extent, character-based approaches have dominated the fields of bioethics, clinical ethics, and medical ethics, physicians, nurses, has long embraced an ethic of care and other relationship approaches. Returning once more to our nurse with the impaired colleague, the ethic ethic of care will direct her first toward gaining a full and empathetic understanding of the context of the situation, including the various relationships that must be protected and preserved if possible. She will seek open communication and a collaborative approach that emphasizes caring and minimizes harm to all parties. For example, she might first approach her friend and offer to accompany her to speak with the appropriate party in the organization to arrange for treatment and address the legal implication of her actions. Context to nursing and health. Moral distress. There's been much research on moral distress. Ethical issues in nursing continue. A large study by Fry and Riley examined the ethical issues encountered by registered nurses in their practice, the frequency that ethical issues occur, the degree to which RNs are concerned by these issues, the way RNs handle ethical issues, and the types of ethics education topics and resources that RNs perceive as helpful in practicing ethically. According to study findings, the following are the most frequent ethical issues experienced by RNs. Protecting patients' rights and human dignity, respecting and not respecting informed consent to treatment, providing care with possible risk to the nurse's health, using and not using physical or chemical restraints, working with staffing patterns that limit patient access to nursing care, Issues that RNs find most disturbing include the following, coping with staffing patterns that limit patient access to nursing care, prolonging the living dying process with inappropriate measures, not considering the quality of a patient's life, implementing managed care policies that threaten quality of life, and working with unethical impaired or impaired colleagues. More than 30% of the respondents reported encountering ethical issues in their practice one to four times per week or daily, in handling their most recently experienced ethical issue, more than 83% reported that they discussed the issue with nursing peers, whereas more than 66% discussed the issue with nursing leadership. On the other hand, more than 5% of the nurses reported that they did not deal with the ethical issue at all. Moral distress related to ethical issues in nursing. There has been much research on moral distress with evidence of moral distress within all healthcare disciplines. Moral distress occurs when you are unable to act upon what you believe is the morally appropriate action to take or when you otherwise act in a manner contrary to your personal and professional values. In other words, you know what to do but believe you cannot do it due to internal or external barriers. Self-doubt, lack of assertiveness, and the perception of powerlessness are examples of internal barriers. External barriers include inadequate staffing, lack of organizational support, poor relationships with colleagues, and policies that conflict with the care needs of patients. Situations that have been shown to cause moral distress are very similar to the common ethical issues noted previously. Many of them occur in end-of-life situations and involve what is perceived to be overly aggressive treatment and inappropriate use of resources. Working with other physicians and nurses who one considers incompetent is another common situation that has been so shown to result in moral distress. The impact of moral distress occurs in two parts. When the situation first occurs, moral distress can result in frustration, anger, guilt, anxiety, withdrawal, self-blame, and other stress-related symptoms. The second part of moral distress is referred to as reactive distress or moral residue, and it is characterized by lingering feelings that can accumulate over time with each subsequent experience of moral distress. At, at least three patterns of response to moral re residue have been described. In the first pattern, a heightened response leads healthcare professionals to engage in activities of conscientious objection such as voicing opposition to a plan of care or refusing to follow orders. 
In the second pattern, they experience a desensitization with a tendency to be passive or to simply withdraw from situations in which they feel ethically challenged. The third pattern is characterized by strong, ongoing physical and psychological stresses that often lead to burnout and leaving the profession. In all cases, the healthcare pro professional's core values, integrity, and professional identity have been undermined. Because of the strong negative impact of unresolved moral distress on the job satisfaction and retention of nurses and other healthcare professionals, leaders in healthcare organizations are becoming aware of the need to create an organizational climate in which ethical issues can be openly discussed and resolved. Interventions have included ethic debriefings, more support for ethics committees, and better access to ethics education and other resources. Ethics and interrelated concepts. Health, health policy, healthcare law, and healthcare economics can all be the source of both ethical guidance and ethical conflict. For example, legal requirements may provide guidance in most situations, but may create conflict in a specific situation that does not quite fit the context for which the legal requirement was intended. Professional identity is contingent upon a conception of ethical practice. The concepts healthcare quality, safety, evidence, collaboration, and technology and informatics are all grounded in ethical obligations, such as preventing needless harm, acting in the patient's best interest, ensuring the best outcomes for the most patients, and serving as a good steward of, of scarce healthcare resources. The concept of leadership has additional ethical obligations, such as balancing loyalties and the interests of patients, employees, the organization, and the community. Patient care and the process of nursing are fraught with ethical problems and dilemmas. For example, the ethical practice of nursing requires that the nurse treat each patient with respect, recognizing and responding to each patient's unique experience of illness and injury. However, ethical challenges can arise at the intersections of patient care, culture, and spirituality, as well as in the face of health disparities. context in nursing and healthcare continued. Ethical decision making and practice. Healthcare decisions that present an ethical dilemma are not made by individuals alone. Healthcare organizations, compliance officer and compliance committee are charged with the responsibility of ensuring that ethical standards are met. Institutions have reporting mechanisms for unethical behaviors. The scope of ethical issues in nursing can be generally examined across the broad categories of clinical, organizational, and health policy issues, with many issues falling into more than one category. Clinical issues can be further subdivided into those at the beginning of life, across the lifespan, and at the end of life. It is beyond the scope of this uh, concept in Concepts book to describe all these exemplars. Featured exemplars, genetic enhancement, Advances in genetics continue to pose numerous ethical issues in practice, particularly at the beginning of life. Pre-implantation and prenatal gen genetic screening not only allow for parents to select embryos free of genetic diseases or predispositions, but are also are now used to select non-medical traits such as gender. Soon parents will be able to select for a range of non-medical traits and genetic enhancements such as eye and hair color, height, and perhaps even intelligence, raising basic questions of respect for persons, parental autonomy, needless harm, and justice. Confidentiality is an issue that can arise across the lifespan in many situations. A particularly complex dilemma involves mandatory reporting of potential domestic or elder abuse. The legal duty to report may be very much at odds with the patient's wishes and may result in unwanted intervention and disruption in the patient's life. Advanced directives for healthcare pose many dilemmas at the end of life. A patient's autonomous wishes or what we think the patient wanted, 
based on the directive may be strongly opposed by the family or the healthcare team. Even patients often change their minds when faced with the reality of their directive. Uncompensated care, organizations face numerous ethical challenges. A common source of ethical conflict for healthcare organizations and their employees is ensuring high quality and cost effective operations while also maintaining safe levels of staffing, purchasing current technologies and continuing to deliver necessary but unreimbursed care to uninsured or underinsured patients. Conflict conflict of interest. Many ethical dilemmas at the bedside begin at the level of healthcare policy. For example, medical marijuana is now legal in nearly half of the U.S. However, federal drug laws direct, directly conflict with the ability of pharmacists and healthcare organizations to dispense it. In addition, there is a lack of a strong evidence-based research for or against its use, particularly in children, posing ethical questions for both individual providers and organizations when treatment with the drug is requested by the patients or parents. Ethical issues in nursing include protecting patients' rights and human dignity, not respecting informed consent treatment, providing care with risk to the health of the nurse, using or not using chemical or physical restraints, understaffing, prolonging the living and dying process with inappropriate measures, policies that could threaten the quality of life, working with unethical or impaired colleagues. Which all of the above causes moral distress. Situations that do cause moral distress in addition are similar to ethical issues, end of life situations, and incompetent practitioners. The impact of moral distress, two parts, results in frustration, anger, guilt, anxiety, withdrawal, self-blame, and other stress-related symptoms. Reactive distress or moral residue, accumulation of feelings over time. Three patterns of response to moral residue, conscientious objection, passivity or withdrawal, and burnout and leaving the profession. Again, interrelated concepts include healthcare policies, healthcare laws, healthcare economics, healthcare quality, safety, evidence, collaboration, and technology. Exemplars include genetic enhancement, confidentiality, advanced directives, uncompensated care, and conflict of interest. What term is used for the process of applying ethical theory and reasoning to daily life? Is it ethics, meta-ethics, norma-ethics, or applied ethics? The answer should be applied ethics is sometimes also referred to as practical ethics and basically provides the justification for actions taken based upon ethical reflection and reasoning. Issues such as abortion, physician-assisted suicide, embryonic stem cell research, and healthcare reform are broadly addressed as what type of ethics? Professional, research, societal, or personal? The answer should be three. Society provides a strong normative basis for ethical behavior through the legal and regulatory systems. Who is the first and initially most powerful influence on our ethical comfort zone? Is it family, friends, coworkers, or religious leaders? And the answer is one, family. Many of our earliest memories are of lessons about right and wrong as taught by parents and other close relatives. This is the end of the slideshow.